Happy Friday, everybody. James Hancock here. I'm back to review the season finale of The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, an episode called One World, One People. Although I guess we're going to have to stop calling it Falcon and the Winter Soldier because at the very end of the episode, the name has been changed to Captain America and the Winter Soldier. And I think the new title has been well earned by a straight up action packed season finale. Also, I should give you a heads up, there was one hidden scene after the credits. It didn't have the biggest Easter eggs or reveals or anything like that. However, I will be discussing that scene as well as any other spoilers from the rest of the episode. So fair warning now if you haven't watched the episode yet. But before I get to my official breakdown, I just want to give a shout out to series creator Malcolm Spellman, as well as director Kerry Skogland, who directed all six episodes. What they've managed to prove is that even in the absence of Steve Rogers, that this world of super soldiers and super spies can continue and continue to thrive and flourish for many years to come. And I think the real secret sauce of this show is that neither Sam Wilson nor Bucky Barnes have been trapped in amber since their introduction back in 2014. When you think about all the adventures that they've had over the last seven years since their characters were introduced to the Marvel Cinematic Universe... It would have been easy for Marvel just to phone it in and kind of give you more or less the same thing with each outing. But by the end of this episode, you could totally see that the torch has been passed from Steve Rogers to these two characters. And when they're hanging out at this party down in Louisiana, you know, playing with kids and having a beer and eating food, I just said the world's biggest smile on my face. The friendship seemed real, seemed sincere, and the two characters are both in dramatically different places than where we found them at the beginning of the season. But the big debate that's going to be taking place over the next couple days is, what do people think of the new Captain America costume? I think on the whole, it's very strong, but I also hope that the costume will continue to evolve the same way it did for Steve Rogers over the many movies that he appeared in. Steve Rogers' outfit in Captain America First Avenger was quite different from what we saw in the Avengers. The version that we saw in the Avengers was my least favorite, and then in the Winter Soldier we got like the stealth outfit, but the costume kept changing in really interesting ways through Civil War and Infinity War, and I imagine the same will hold true for Sam Wilson. Because while the costume looks really cool, it's real bright and it's real colorful. And I don't mind the color scheme at all. But for me, it was a little bulky looking. I feel like Sam Wilson deserves something a little more form-fitting, a little more sleek. But I'll tell you one thing that I really liked about the new costume is they found a way to incorporate the shield in a way that felt practical and organic. Sometimes, but not always in the comics, when Sam Wilson started wearing the costume of Captain America, some of the artists didn't quite know what to do with both the shield and the wings at the same time. And they would draw Sam sometimes flying, flapping his wings with the shield over one arm. And obviously for somebody whose powers are all about flying, a slick aerodynamic appearance is absolutely essential for suspension of disbelief. And obviously nothing could be less aerodynamic than Sam trying to flap his wings with a big shield on his arm. But what was cool about the show is that when he wasn't using the shield, he would put it between his shoulder blades, which makes all the sense in the world, so that when he was flying and when the camera was looking at him head on, he still had a very aerodynamic feel to his overall costume. And for me, the biggest fist-pumping moment of the entire episode is at one point when he breaks away from his fight with Batroc, throws the shield through the window, launches himself out, flies after the shield, catches it, and puts it between his shoulders. He just looks so goddamn badass in that moment. But let's start sinking our teeth into this episode. As I mentioned before, it was heavily driven by action in a good way. And I think it was my second favorite episode of the season behind the amazing episode three. Episode three for me is my favorite pop culture event of 2021 so far. But I love how the episode wasted no time whatsoever. We see Bucky walking around New York looking cool as fuck in full costume. And we see Sam flying by the Manhattan skyline. But it didn't take long for the Flag Smashers to attack the GRC. Sam blasts through the window. And for a brief shining moment, I was like, ooh, that costume kind of looks like it was designed by Nike. But after some initial hesitance on my part, I got into the swing of things, especially when I saw all the different ways that Sam would be able to use his wings and his jetpack in conjunction with and combination with the shield to create new combinations. It also helped that he jumped right into a fight with Batrock the Leaper, aka GSP. And while George St. Pierre is not necessarily the world's greatest actor, he's one of my all-time favorite fighters in MMA. And seeing him cut loose with a barrage of kicks, it was just so much goddamn fun. And hopefully this will open the door to more MMA fighters stepping over into the MCU anytime they feel like their days in the octagon might be drawn to a close. And what I liked about this final episode is that everybody got a chance to shine at different points throughout the episode, both good guys and bad guys. We had a cool moment where Bucky tells Carly over the phone that she's going to remember everyone that she killed. Something that he's been wrestling with, obviously, all season long. And something that he gets to put to bed by the end of the episode when he finally confesses the killing of a man's son 
and is able to turn over his little notebook to his doctor once and for all, putting all of his past killings behind him. It gave us a great sense of closure for the character. It makes me wonder what the future might hold for the Winter Soldier. But he got some good action beats as well. We saw him blasting around on a motorcycle. Steve Rogers would absolutely approve the motorcycle was his preferred mode of transport as well. And we got to see Sharon Carter being totally badass even before the revelation that she's the power broker. At one point, she plants like this acid bomb on one of the Flag Smashers, which is pretty hardcore for the MCU, but it makes sense. She has no fancy powers. She has no fancy gadgets. So when it comes down to fighting a super-powered individual, she can't really afford to pull any punches. And as I mentioned before, my favorite moment of the episode by far is when Sam hurls the shield through the window, says au revoir to, to Batroc the Leaper and leaps after it, which opens up the most complex and obviously the most expensive part of, of all the action sequences as Sam is basically taking on two helicopters. And it gave us two really cool bits. At one point, he lands on a road and he basically shells up like a turtle, using both his wings and his shield at the same time, but also really enjoyed watching him coordinate with another pilot on the other helicopter where she was in position to take over after he blasts through and takes out the flag smasher flying the helicopter. But probably the most hardcore moment of the episode is when John Walker shows up with that homemade shield of his. He confronts Carly and she says the absolute worst thing she could possibly say. She tells him, I don't want to hurt people that don't matter. And for John Walker, hearing Lamar being dismissed that way, it just takes his rage to another level. And one of my few criticisms of this season is that we never really got to see John Walker go completely stark raving nuts. I mean, obviously, we got to see him chop someone to pieces with the shield, which was intense. But I was kind of hoping that the show would take their foot off the brakes and really let John Walker go to the dark side the way that he did in the comics before he finally settled down. But what was cool is that John Walker was given opportunities to redeem himself because at one point he has to make a choice between fighting Flag Smashers or saving a van full of hostages that's about to fall into this construction site. And he opts for saving people as opposed to getting revenge, which opened the door to one of my favorite parts all season toward the end of the episode when he shows up in the classic costume for U.S. agent. He's going to be going to work for Contessa Valentina Allegra de la Fontaine, but already they've got some great chemistry. And I just hope that we'll get some moments with U.S. agent like we saw in the comics when John Walker first joined the West Coast Avengers. He and Hawkeye immediately had friction. Hawkeye was a bit of a hothead, and John Walker basically just chucked him across the room. But there's this great bit when he's confronting Vic Vision after Vision's been dismantled and reassembled, and John Walker just absolutely can't handle the fact that Vision's just standing there completely buck-ass nude in the middle of the room, and he starts ordering him to put some clothes on. Who knows how Marvel's going to shuffle the deck and all the teams as we move forward, but Wyatt Russell is so goddamn talented, and I just feel like it's going to open up all sorts of interesting possibilities, and I don't know if he should get his own show or not. I feel like he's at his best when he gets to be part of an ensemble group. Also, U.S. Agent should remain a part of this supporting cast of characters in and around the character of Captain America. In any event, I'm just glad to see that Marvel clearly is laying the groundwork for future stories starring John Walker. But I feel like all Marvel Easter eggs aside or all future plans for the MCU aside, the best way you can judge a show or a movie is by the amount of emotion that it generates in you while you're watching it. I feel like chills up and down your forearm or up and down your neck are always a great way to gauge whether or not a show is getting to you. And I had at least like two or three moments this episode where I just felt waves of chills or just genuine, sincere, heartfelt joy. At one point, this old dude says, that's the Black Falcon. Another guy says, no, that's Captain America. And that was cool. But I think the moment that really got to me is when we hear Bucky call him Cap and of all the characters in the MCU whose opinion matters about whether or not Sam Wilson's doing a good job as Captain America I feel like it all boils down to Bucky Captain America's oldest friend and I think Anthony Mackie's got the chops to play Captain America for a very very long time and I have to say I love his approach to the character he has a really interesting scene where he confronts some members of the GRC basically saying that the overuse of labels when it comes to describing one's political adversaries is a giant part of the problem and that he encourages everyone to try and do better and that before you want to label somebody something like a terrorist you should pause and think about the forces that drive misguided teenagers to violence for a particular cause. While Sam clearly doesn't approve of their tactics, I mean, he has that great scene where he confronts Carly earlier in the episode where he says, I'm trying something different. Maybe you should do the same. That said, while he's opposed to their goals, he's at least able to open his eyes and see things from their point of view, even if he's going to do everything in his power to stop them. But somebody who's clearly not going to see things from the Flag Smashers point of view is Baron Zemo and his butler, because at one point, the remaining Flag Smashers are being loaded up in a van, and there's one cop who shows him some sympathy, says, one world, one people's like, oh no, are they going to escape? But then the van explodes and you see that old dude kind of smiling from a distance. And then we cut to Baron Zemo in his cell on the raft listening to the radio. And he's just enjoying a nice book, but he sits back with a big satisfied smile on his face knowing that his enemies are now in their grave. And I don't know if Baron Zemo would be a better character on a season two of Captain America and the Winter Soldier or 
fingers crossed, if they'll finally give him a Thunderbolt show where he gets to lead his own team of villains. In any event, going back to moments that gave me chills, I really enjoyed the scene where Sam goes to Isaiah Bradley's house, and he has this incredible line where he says, We built this country, bled for it, I'm not going to let anyone tell me I can't fight for it. And while Isaiah has a slightly more cynical view, it's impossible not to get swept up with emotion when they go to the Captain America Museum, and Sam shows Isaiah the new exhibit, which honors Isaiah Bradley's, as well as all the other guinea pigs who were subjected to all the experiments that gave Isaiah his enhanced abilities back in the 1950s during the Korean War. And as they hug it out, I got a little misty-eyed. And then the episode gave us a great happy ending down in Louisiana. That food looked good as hell. I would love to take advantage of some of that Louisiana cooking. I love seeing Bucky playing with the kids and they're hanging on his metal arm. And there just seems to be this genuine, sincere partnership and friendship between Sam and Buck now that I think could pay massive dividends in a season two. One of my only complaints about this episode is that the hidden scene in the closing credits wasn't much of a reveal. Obviously, we know that Sharon Carter is the power broker and she killed Batroc when he tried to squeeze her for more money. And what I liked about the early reveal about her as the power broker is that it explained why Carly and all of her fellow Flag Smashers had some combat training. They were the hired muscle working for the power broker. And we see as Sharon Carter moves forward, she's getting out of the super soldier business and she's getting into the business of selling government secrets, which is a dramatic departure from the comics where Sharon Carter was more often than not portrayed in a heroic fashion, especially in the 21st century. But if Marvel wants to set her up as a villain moving forward, they've got my curiosity. But so many of these characters have my curiosity moving forward. It's a great ensemble cast. And I, for one, need another show featuring a who's who of super spies and superheroes and supervillains all playing in the sandbox. So my hope is that Marvel will make an announcement on that front in the very near future. So chalk me up as a very satisfied fan. I went into this show with very high expectations, and while some episodes were stronger than others, some storylines were stronger than others, nonetheless, I think it was a very solid show across the board. And if I had to choose between WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier... Maybe WandaVision took more creative risks, but when it comes to my own taste and storytelling, Falcon and the Winter Soldier well and thoroughly scratched the itch that I have for this kind of storytelling. But I think that's all I got to say for now because I'm eager to check out Mortal Kombat, which also made its debut this morning. But if you've been sticking with me since the beginning of the season, you have my genuine and sincere thanks for the support for this channel. And if you've liked these reviews, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell. I guess for the next couple weeks, I can sleep in on Friday morning, but in June, I'll definitely be back to tackle the new miniseries Loki. But I'll have some reviews for some other shows and movies between now and then because I've been getting some good news from Netflix recently when it comes to press screeners, so more on that in the near future. In any event, if you want to talk more, hunt me down on Twitter, at Geeking Out, but I can't thank you for watching. Hope everyone has an amazing weekend, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.